The Grignard reaction is quite a useful reaction for forming new carbon-carbon bonds. The one major downside to the Grignard reaction is its incredible sensitivity to water. Presence of even a small amount of water is capable of ruining the reaction. This is just a quick list of the chemicals that I use in this reaction. I didn't list the quantity of the ether, the hydrochloric acid, or the sodium hydroxide because you should have all of these in abundance. An oven dried, three necked round bottom flask was charged with 1.5 grams of magnesium as well as 15 milliliters of dry ether. The apparatus is closed from the atmosphere and a drying tube is at the top of the condenser column. 5 milliliters of bromopropane was then injected into the solution. The bromopropane was added slowly until the reaction started and then the rest was added. At this point the reaction will start to occur and you can see the ether starting to reflux and boil. If the reaction does not start, adding a couple crystals of iodine almost always gets it to start. You can see here that the solution has turned black and a lot of the ether is being lost, so you're going to need to add more. As the reaction progresses, I keep injecting ether in order to try to maintain a constant volume. If you use a very cold condenser column, you probably don't have to do this, but since I'm just using tap water, a lot of the ether was lost out the top. The reaction between the bromopropane and the magnesium is shown above. The bromopropane reacts with the magnesium to form the Grignard reagent. This reaction is very exothermic, so it causes the ether to boil, and that's why it's very important to have a condenser column. Once the bubbling stops and the ether stops boiling, the reaction is complete and you can allow it to cool down to room temperature. Afterwards, a CO2 generator was set up using dry ice as shown. Because the Grignard reagent is very sensitive to moisture, just for good measure, I flushed the flask with nitrogen as well as the feeding tube. The needle was then placed into the solution with strong stirring and CO2 was fed in. As more and more CO2 is added, the solution becomes thicker and thicker. The reaction between the CO2 and the Grignard reagent is shown above. As CO2 is bubbled through the solution, there will be a loss of ether, so you're going to have to replenish it several times. Bubble the CO2 through the solution for 15 minutes at least. The product was transferred to an Erlenmeyer flask and washed several times with a total of 60 milliliters of 3 molar hydrochloric acid. The addition of the hydrochloric acid induces hydrolysis which leads to the formation of our final butyric acid product. The reaction that is taking place is shown above. I did my best to wash out as much product as possible but there still was some that remained in the three necked round bottom. After the addition of the hydrochloric acid the solution will bubble. Swirl the mixture around and don't proceed to the next step until the bubbling has stopped. In the end, the solution should be completely transparent with a small ether layer on top and a larger aqueous layer on the bottom. Then, I directly vacuum filtered the solution into a separatory funnel. This step is necessary to remove any unreacted magnesium metal, but you definitely don't need to use the same setup that I did. Directly vacuum filtering into the separatory funnel just saves a few steps. The vacuum filtration apparatus was then washed with 50 milliliters of ether. The solution was mixed thoroughly with frequent venting. The lower aqueous layer was drained and discarded and the ether layer was maintained. Butyric acid is much more soluble in ether than in water, so most of the butyric acid should be in the ether layer but some will be lost in the aqueous layer. Wash the ether layer with 30 milliliters of water and save the ether layer. Then wash the ether layer with 21 milliliters of 3 molar sodium hydroxide and save the aqueous layer this time. This neutralizes the butyric acid and brings the sodium butyrate into the aqueous layer. 
wash the ether layer again with 15 milliliters of 3 molar sodium hydroxide and again save the aqueous layer. Then wash the ether layer one last time with 15 milliliters of water and again save the aqueous layer. The aqueous layers are then added back to the separatory funnel and reacidify using 50 milliliters of 3 molar hydrochloric acid. This regenerates the ether soluble butyric acid. The butyric acid was then extracted using 30 milliliters of ether three times. Remember that it's always better to do multiple washings with a smaller volume than one washing with a large volume. The combined ether layers were then washed twice with 50 milliliters of saturated salt solution to dry it. The ether washings were then drained into a round bottom flask and dried using sodium sulfate. I used a separatory funnel and a small vial to evaporate the ether. I opted to use this method because using a rotovap could stink up the lab. This way, the butyric acid stays in the fume hood the whole time. Finally, I'm left with my final product, which is clearly contaminated with something considering the pink color. I'm entirely unsure what the pink color is caused by, but I ran an NMR and it came back pretty clean.